came in the Salt Spring Island in 1998 uh, via England and via the Northwest Territories. I worked in the Canadian Arctic for about 25 years, primarily in education uh, with Aboriginal people. And I came to, um, then went to England to make sure I still had a brain. I went and did some postgraduate studies in economics at University of Essex, and then I came here. Um, at first I was uh, offered to do some consulting work, but to me consulting is like asking somebody to look at their watch and tell them what time it is. So I, I rapidly moved on to doing something completely different, which is farming. It's not completely different in terms of my family, because my grandfather was a farmer back in northern Quebec. But for me, it was a, a bit of an introduction. Uh, the, the property that we have uh, didn't have anything growing on it. They had sheep, uh, they had um, horses, and they had um, some uh, goats. And um, so when they left, except for the chicken, they left that behind, um, there were no animals left on the property. So I decided that I would turn it into an orchard. And so I got serious into planting um, apple trees, fruit trees of all kinds of descriptions. So far in the last uh, 20 odd years, I've grown probably about 80 varieties of apples. Uh, my neighbor is Bob Whedon, who grows 108 to 25 uh, varieties. And uh, I've been, uh, since the very beginning of the Apple Festival in 1999, I've been involved with that. I've never considered myself a farmer. I've considered myself an orchardist. And I've really, uh, it's all been um, um, uh, a learning curve, uh, an experience that I've really enjoyed doing, yeah. What is it that interests you about growing fruit trees? Um, well, <laughs> you get fruit out of them, actually, the, 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 the variety. I was not aware of the various uh, cultivars, the various uh, varieties of apples that you can grow, and pears, and cherries, and whatnot. I, I, I was not aware of the fascination of the, of the whole cycle of, uh, of growing uh, fruit. Uh, pollination, uh, um, uh, disease, uh, harvesting, storage, you name it, the whole gamut. It's pretty, it's pretty intense and if you've never done it before, the learning curve is very, very steep. So I really enjoyed it. It kept me very, very focused for a long time and it still does. Um, I, uh, I can tell you that there are certain varieties that I would grow again and other varieties I would never touch with a 10-foot pole. Some of them are very, uh, some trees are very productive. I learned about, I learned about various rootstocks. I learned about various uh, soil conditions. I learned about various uh, um, fertilizers, which I put none on my trees. I, I don't spray at all. I, uh, I read enough about um, just how you can make things happen naturally to uh, get what I need out of the, out of the uh, harvest that I get, yeah. Can you, you've also been very involved with agriculture more generally on Salt Spring. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. a, uh, a director of the Farmers Institute mm -hmm. for 14 years and mm -hmm. on the Farmland Trust. Can you talk a little bit both about your own involvement in agriculture and also what you've seen over the last 20 years in terms of changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I started to volunteer for the Farmers Institute the first year I was here. and. Uh, about four years after that, I became a director and um, a director secretary for the Institute. And uh, it gave me quite a, an appreciation for what's been going on on Salt Spring in agriculture. Um, the, uh, the, the range of issues that we've dealt with over the years has gone everything from uh, um, gypsy moth or whatever, they, uh, any kind of of uh, disease uh, on the uh, on uh, crops or fruits or whatever else, and uh, and just the challenges of, of farming on Salt Spring in terms of the cost of the land and all that good stuff. So it's it's uh, I, I don't I'd have to focus on specific um, specific um, events that occurred. But uh, for the most part, it's been just a real education program for me. Um, in terms of the Farmland Trust, um, there was a debate that was a very interesting process. 
because it came as a result of the area foreign plan. And uh, what we did there is that uh, we, uh, we were transferring, we were being transferred a piece of property from the Farmers Institute that they, they had been recipients from Three Point Property. And the idea was to make sure that we would have uh, we would be able to respond to a broad range of, uh, of concerns in, in the community about the kind of farming that would occur in a community farm and the establishment of community gardens. I must say that when we first started the, uh, the, the Farmland Trust, um, we didn't envisage doing community gardens. It was a, uh, it was a directive, if you like, of um, the federal government in its appointing us as a charitable organization that we have within our uh, purposes a community garden. So that's how the community garden got proposed into that or uh, in put into our, consti our constitutional purposes. Oddly enough, uh, the, the, the board members were kind of like surprised by the idea of having a community garden. I mean, there are enough gardens that are empty on this, on this island that having a community garden will probably be going to be sitting empty. And what happened there is that we ended up with, well, within the first year, we had a waiting list of people who wanted to use the community gardens. And that's because of the, uh, the watering system that we put in, the fencing, the deer fencing, the rabbit fencing. It was really quite, um, uh, uh, it was for a lot of people on this island, it represented a, a go-to place in terms of growing your own stuff and having neighbors right beside you showing you how to do it properly, et cetera, et cetera. Or not so much properly, but just learning from other people, yeah. Uh, so the Farm and Trust, uh, Farmers Institute, uh, the actual advisory planning commission as well for 14 or 16 years. Uh, that's been a, a real education as well. Um, the, uh, the Islands Trust um, doesn't uh, give uh, agriculture um, a, a large, a, um, a, an important, a, a significant uh, uh, attention in terms of what's needed here in terms of making agriculture happen. Uh, there was, for a, a period of time, a certain amount of uh, energy towards agriculture from the uh, Islands Trust, but for the most part, I would have to say that it's it's been lacking. There's the, if you look at the the, uh, the the mantra that comes out of the Islands Trust, it is more to do with um, uh, preserving and protecting, which is a good thing, but also I think that you want to also use the land in order to produce food for local people. Yeah. Given your experience and with getting the community farm going, community gardens, community yeah. farm going, and the, yeah. the time and effort it took, do you think it would be a good idea to, for the future agricultural consulting to focus on more community farms? Yeah, I think you could. I think it's surprisingly the the the, the amount of land that we had there, the sixty acres. Well, it only took a couple of years for that to be basically fully used. And it was a surprise to some of us because when you look at the, 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 the amount of land on Salt Spring that remains empty um, and, and not being cultivated or, or, or uh, planted for any kinds of crops, it's, it was surprising that you know, we, we set up a structure for it and we set up amenities for it, like water being a principal one um, because of the pond that's there. But uh, I think that there's, you could use that approach um, on a lot of the empty land on South Spring Island. I think that there's, there's ways of uh, using what's not being cultivated or turned to agriculture right now by um, inviting people to come and talk about it and, and, and inviting people to uh, generate their own ideas and, and uh, directions on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you were involved with the, the first Salt Spring Area Farm Plan, yeah. which was published in 2008. How important do you think that is in terms of promoting sustainable agriculture here? The, uh, the first uh, um, area of farm plan came of, as a result of, at the time the um, Agricultural Advisory Committee to the Islands Trust was working on um, amendments to and directions to deal with um, uh, what they call bylaw 355, which was um, uh, changes in terms of it, it was butting up against uh, the, the the rules or the regulations within the, the the bylaw were coming up against the right to farm act and the right to farm period, 
And so well, the best way to, rather than try to, to chisel away at the, 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 uh, the regulatory side of it, the idea was to attempt to get the community to, to work with the, the concurrent, what was happening at the same time was the official community plan, to, to drive a, a, an enthusiasm, a, 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 um, a, a direction for farming on Salt Spring Island. And that, that was the, the primary purpose of it. Because we could have just worked with the, 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 uh, making changes as, as slowly but surely on the area farm plan, uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, bylaw 355. But by having an area farm, by working towards an area farm plan, then we brought in a lot more various ideas. We had, at the time, it was composed of uh, uh, ING, Iron Natural Growers, with the, the chairperson there was uh, Anne Macy, and the uh, Farmers Institute. And there was a, a representatives from both farming organizations, and they came together to, uh, to make the uh, farm plan a, a, a reality. It took us about a year and a half to do the plan. Um, in, in that plan, we, we, uh, we, we also hired a, a consultant, a guy by the name of Derek Masslink, who be, later became a trustee of the Islands Trust for Pender Island. And what we did there is that uh, he basically became our scribe, but we invited community members to come regularly and talk to the committee. And once we got a, a draft, uh, a fair understanding of how we would break, uh, go forward with the plan, what we did is we had three community uh, meetings. Uh, one talking about the challenges of farming on Salt Spring, uh, another, uh, another one, a series of workshops to deal with um, the way in which uh, currently um, uh, it's being farmed on Salt Spring and finally how the future would look in farming on Salt Spring. So it was a three-stage approach. And out of those three workshops, we brought in some recommendations. We wanted to make them realistic and achievable, as any strategic plan wants to be. And um, it came out actually with 30-odd uh, recommendations that I think most of them or achievable, many of them have been achieved or put into place. Yeah. So if, um, so my, my last question, question is, is if I was a young farmer living in, oh, no, sorry, if I was a young person living in Vancouver or Victoria, yes. and I wanted to come to Salt Spring and farm, what advice would you have for that person? It's possible. Um, and they don't, uh, there's going to be a lot of, um, people in Salt Spring who are doing it currently, young farmers uh, who you can go to and they will be very supportive and very helpful. Um, uh, you don't be deterred by naysayers um, because of the cost of property or, or whatever uh, limitations you may think are there. Um, I think that there's a, a genuine market for local foods on Salt Spring Island. I mean, all you can do is go to a Saturday market, a Tuesday market, and you know it's, uh, you're not going to be wasting your energy. You're going to see a result of it. You're going to, and finally, I think you'll probably find a niche for your, for your product and for yourself in the community. The most difficult thing you're going you're gonna to be faced with coming to Salt Spring to do that kind of work is going to be housing, affordable housing for you. In terms of, you, of, of accessing land to do farming, I don't think that that would be an issue. I, again, uh, the, the biggest problem for Salt Spring is, is housing and the cost of. Uh, land is, is available. All you need to do is find ways of approaching people to use their land. Yeah. Is there a, a fix to the housing issue? Jeez, I wish I had it. Yeah, if I did that, I wouldn't be here. No, I think, is there a fix to it? I, I think. I, I don't, right now, I don't, like, look, for me personally, I mean, my, I give you my personal experience, uh, it, Tony, is that um, my daughter is a nurse at the hospital here. She became at uh, Salt Spring uh, 10 years ago, two girls, single mother, and she was living in various houses here on Salt Spring, and it was costing over $2,000 a month for rent. It doesn't make sense. So I ended up uh, emptying out my workshop, two-story workshop, and turning it into a home for her on my property, and that's where she lives. I mean, there, there's, if, uh, the, the, and the meeting that we had with Adam Molson also, people talked about that. People talked about the fact that you need farm worker housing 
on the island, people who want to work the, the land, but the, 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 the current uh, regulations, the current limitations to that make it impossible for you to do that. I think that there are ways that you can get around, or you, no, not around, I think there are ways that, that you can put in place some very workable solutions to, to, uh, to housing on this island. And in, in, it means uh, changing some of the regulations that are currently there. But also at the same time getting some sort of assurances that if you make those changes that the original purpose of that housing remains the same. In other words, you don't, you, you don't end up, uh, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not separate as uh, segregating, but uh, parceling out a piece of your property and then you sell it at a profit. And what I'm saying is that you, you make sure that it remains for the original purpose that it was intended. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank, thank you. you. No, you're welcome. Yeah, it's kind of like that, I think. Uh, yeah. I think I think that you know I didn't deal with the issues of the farmers institute very well. The, the the thing that I found here is that the the over the years, if there's a change that I've seen, Tony, um, at the farmers institute, is that when I first came here, um, the energy of local people for communal uh, input, volunteerism, for doing stuff, was much higher than it is now. Um, I, I look at Fall Fair and God, we, 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 would, we would turn people away, but it was like self-evident, the number of people that would show up and roll up their sleeves. People will come down here with tractors, they go up there and level the, 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 the fields and I mean the Cunninghams and the, and the Barclays and they'd all be, they'd all be here and they'd, they'd, within, within a week you'd have the fair ready. Now it takes a group of about 10, 12 of us. I was here this morning preparing for the, uh, the, the, in the food court, cleaning out all the bins. There's maybe about a dozen of us that work. You know, it's a, it used to be, and the number of people, even at our AGM. Yeah. When I joined the, the, the Farmers Institute at the AGM, the, the year you were yeah. elected, there were, oh, there was hundreds of people in the room. Uh, now you're lucky if you get 30 people, 25 30, people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it just, it's just, the energy, the energy for organizational, um, uh, what's the word I'm for? Uh, organizational uh, input, uh, drive, uh, uh, working together is just not what it used to be. I don't think we could do the transfer from three-point property at the Farmers Institute the way we did it 10 years ago. Right. I don't think it's so. It's the same of every organization on Salt Spring yeah. uh, uh, complaining about the lack of volunteers. I mean, as I, if a whole new culture has arrived. It's just that people would rather give money and, and be done with it as opposed to giving of themselves and their time and their expertise. There's a tremendous amount of expertise on this island. I mean, we, uh, of all the, over the years, the directors we've had that I've dealt with at the Farmers Institute, I mean, there, there's been some very, very highly qualified people who've done things in a professional career, which is really quite remarkable. Um, we can't get those people anymore, you know, is this, and, and uh, I, I, you, you find that you, you, you burn people out, and that's I think is what's going on. I don't, I don't. That, that there's a transition over the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years on this island. It, for me, it's been the, the, the lack of, uh, of volunteerism, the kind of volunteerism that used to be here. Is that the main reason that people are burnt out? I, I, I think what the reason I'm burnt out is that the people who stay behind end up doing all the work because there's nobody else there. I mean, when, when the whole thing about the, um, the area farm plan being re redone again, I think is a wonderful idea. And uh, I was very tempted to be involved with it, but I figured, no, I think it'd be better for a fresh set of eyes, a fresh set of ears, a fresh set of ideas to go into that thing and see what comes out of it. But I was really tempted to be involved. I gotta tell you, I kinda, maybe I should, maybe I should, but in the end, I, I kind of went like, no, having a different perspective is very important. This community needs a different perspective. Maybe it's because of old farts like me and George have been around these organizations for too long that we've held back, you know, new ideas, new ways of looking at things. And uh, I'm hoping that that's, that's, uh, that's the case because I'm looking forward to see what comes out of it. Yeah. But you will be involved in 
Yeah, I know, but not at the level I was the last time. I mean, let me tell you, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work, but it was, it was fun work. We were engaged with the community. I mean, we would get at those three workshops, we had over 100 people at each workshop, and not the same people. I mean, it was really engaging. I mean, it was a lot of fun. It really was a lot of fun. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's the biggest change. What do you think, George? Do you agree? Yeah, yeah I look back at the co-ops and things that we were on. Yeah, yeah the Growing Circle Food Co-op. You know, we the started that. Pardon me? And the Apple Co-op. And the Apple Co-op, yeah. Uh, well, the Apple Co-op never got off the ground. I mean, it went, once we did all the, the preliminary work with the co-op, and then we, we had all the work done and whatnot, and then we handed it over to to get it done, and then poof, it just like, didn't go anywhere. Because there was no, it was going to be a new organization. Well, the, the people who run the Farmland Trust are the same people who run this organization, the same people who run that organization. I mean, you must feel that at the, at the Ag Alliance. I mean, there would have been a time, say uh, 10, 15 years ago, you would not have been in that situation. You would have been a lot more directly supported by ING and Farmers Institute. But uh, you must feel sometimes like you're way out in the field by yourself. Let's see, no, we have a whole range of new directors. Yeah, which is good. Who's come in and brought a lot of energy in. Perfect. So younger farmers. And we'll see where it goes. What was the Growing Circle Co-op? The Growing Circle Co-op was formed in 2000. It was um, um, Ellie Parts, right? Yeah. Ellie Parts? Yeah. Ellie Parts was the uh, first president. Um, they, it was uh, an idea of uh, a place where uh, farmers on the island can bring their produce and be sold. It's, uh, it was located where um, the, uh, the sushi place is now. Um, what's it called? Uh, 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 Gato, whatever his name is, uh, the sushi, right beside the pasta place uh, and gasoline alley. We had a store there. It was run by volunteers that did all the packing and the, and the, uh, the sorting of the vegetables and whatnot. And at the front end, it was staff. It was a co-op that was meant to support staff, support the customers, and support the producers. People like Charlie Eagle and, uh, and George, myself, and other people would bring our produce there for sale, and it would be sold at the co-op, yeah. It was uh, called the Growing Circle Food Co-op. Why did it end? Because... Um, we had, we had over 600 um, members. If every member spent $25 a week in that bloody thing, it would still be going today. People wanted to be members, but you couldn't buy your diapers there. You couldn't buy your, your toothbrush there. You couldn't buy your, your, um, your, uh, your meat there. You couldn't, so it was not one-stop shopping. You had to go there, and then you had to go to thrifties or to country grocery or you had to go somewhere else. So it's death, death meal was basically that it wasn't one stop shopping. People wanted convenience and that's why it, it, it lasted, how long did it last, four or five years? Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. If it happened now, I think it would go. I think if it happened now, well the, you see the place behind uh, the optical place here downtown, it tried something like that and it didn't work. And then, and then there was a, uh, there used to be a, 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 a well, I'm going to call it a fruit and vegetable store where Apple Photo is now. Apple Photo, uh, beside Mars Buns, there used to be a big food, remember that, that, that grocery store? Not grocery, but only fruits and vegetables. That's all that they sold there. And some local people actually, before the food co-op started, used to supply that place too. It went down the drain. The food co-op went down the drain. And you know, when, when Pat, Pat Rackar gets excited about the root and whatnot, my concern is that you're going to need to have some structure, in other words, some paid staff and whatnot to keep that thing going. Because if you're counting on, on local volunteers to do it, it's not going to happen. Because the first time somebody brings in some bad fruit or bad vegetables and sells it in the same area as somebody else bringing in really good stuff at the same price, something's going to give. Uh, this just for the hell of it. But I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, the growing circle co-op. Uh, Jana, what was her name? It was, it was a good group. It was a good group of people. But like I said, we were with the survey that we did in 2000, 
to get the grant to, to start the thing up said that if we access 4% of the amount of money that Salt Springers are spending on buying produce food, we would make a go of it. All we needed to access was 4% of the market. Interesting, huh? Eh? Yeah. Great.